Welcome to the Swim Swim Breakdown. As always, I'm Coleman Hodges coming to you from Austin, Texas. We are joined by Swim Swim Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Senior International Reporter Loretta Race from French 75 Boutique in Kentucky. How's it going, guys? Coleman, I now that you're finally back in Texas, can you do the rest of this podcast with a, a big, thick drawl? <laughs> Why, yes. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> Hook him. <laughs> I don't know if that's quite a Texas draw, but I'll, I'll allow it. All that's right. like a Southern Kentucky draw. Yeah. <laughs> we, we know that my accents and pronunciations are both terrible. So that's yeah. the best I got. That'd be a for fun you. game. Have Coleman pronounce European swimmers' last names using a Texas accent. Let's get to some swimming news. USA Swimming releases the 2023 competition schedule, including four stops on the Pro Swim Series and a (laughs) pre-Worlds year Worlds Trials, which blew my mind. Wasn't sure we were going to get that. Uh, I think some of the athletes were not sure about that either. We don't usually see this, but... We've got trials in Indy at the end of June, and then World Championships starts just two to three weeks later in Fukuoka, Japan. What do we think of this 2023 competition schedule? Well, you know, the first thing is that gap. It's going back to sort of the way things used to be, where you'd go to trials and you'd bring a second bag in case you made the team (laughs) because you're getting right on the plane and going, right? Like you say goodbye to your girlfriend, you say goodbye to your parents, say goodbye to your boyfriend and uh, head out to camp. Um, So I I think that's what's going to happen. I think this was a good move by USA Swimming to put something out because things have just been chaos with last minute announcements in terms of how people are going to make teams and and what meets we're even going to send teams to. Um, So I think it was a good move to do so. Um, I would love to pick Tim Hinchy's brain about how some of these things came about and how they made some of these decisions. Um, Because Indianapolis to Japan in two weeks is not a lot of time to adjust. Um, So we'll see how that works out. Yeah, I'm on this. I'm on the same train that I'm glad that something was actually published because it seems like Finney, uh, Finney is just drawing something out of a hat and it's like, oh, February Worlds. That sounds great. So, you know, actually having a plan that's documented and hopefully they did consult the athletes or at least the coaches of the, the main Probably athletes. The like, coaches. Yeah, I, I think that that well, OK, well, we'll talk about Worlds in a minute, but. Anyway, so I'm glad that something was actually documented so that there is kind of a roadmap, although I'm sure that subject to revision was, you know, inserted there on several occasions. Personally, I love the schedule. Knoxville's nice. Fort Lauderdale, yes. Chicago, yes. Uh, Mission Viejo, yes. Uh, So for my travel schedule, I love it. But (laughs) Indy to Japan in that two weeks I mean, it, it, like you said, Braden, it reminds me of specifically 2018. We had nationals, which were also served as pan pack trials in Irvine, and then they flew to Tokyo. And you know, then they flew to Japan and went to pan packs right after that. I'm kind of curious how that went, but I guess it's like it's the middle of the country. Everyone can it's it's, it's accessible. I'm sure Indy's an easy place to have a meet. They already have nationals in Irvine uh, a couple months later. Is there a specific place you think trials would be better to have it at? like the second week of June. Is that a place? <laughs> um, it's not so much the indie. It's, it's just because I'm, you know, they'll, they'll put them on all, all on a bus to Chicago or on a little puddle jumper to Chicago and then fly out from there on a charter, I assume. So that's really not a big deal. They might actually just fly straight out of Indy on a charter. Now that I say it out loud, it's uh it's sort of the opposite. Like it's, it, I think what's so shocking about it is that Normally, the world championships before the Olympics and the year before the Olympics, we have to say now because there's a world championship during the Olympic year, um, is that meet that the premise is there's no trials. The team has been picked. People know where they're going and they have sort of this opportunity to build a perfect runway into that meet which hasn't always worked out, right? Like we've had relays miss finals in that pre-Olympic world championship. So, you know, looking at the evidence, I'm not sure who looks at that and says, oh yeah, this idea is working. We should definitely stick with it. Um, but it's, it's just like, we're doing the total opposite. It's a, you know, a very last minute selection meet. Um, athletes have to work the double taper. They have to work on a, a short turnaround on the 
many time zones um, move. How many time zones away is that from At least Indianapolis? Four. It's 442 in Indianapolis right now, and it's 542 a.m. in Japan. Okay. So 13. 13, 13 or 11, depending on which direction you go. <laughs> um, in, in any case, it's about as big of an adjustment as you can make on the planet Earth. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, at this point, everybody's flying by the seat of their pants. Yeah, I was going to say professional so sports. We're doing, change their minds. Yeah. You know, We're doing adaptability. I think athletes, if anything, in the past couple of years have learned adaptability and, you know, being able to, to change things and not be so set in a course of action and, and being able to alter things. So have they learned that, though? Like, have we seen the Have we seen the results? Caleb left after two swims at, at yeah, the World totally, Championship. Totally. So, like, did he learn adaptability? It, okay. There's going to be outliers. He's an outlier. And it totally could have been something different. It could not have been related. Uh, to speak on that and to silence our commenters, we still don't know what happened. <laughs> no one has come the, I mean, I haven't even heard like an off the record rumor that I can't share. It's well, sorry. I've heard rumors, but they're basically. I've heard theories. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> theories. Nothing but really reputable. Come to me and said, Oh, this is what happened, but don't tell anybody. Like that hasn't even happened, which is is pretty shocking. So we don't know. There's the answer to that one, everyone <laughs> in the comment section. Speaking of adaptability, uh, Fina has chosen an interesting plan of adaption for their uh, the rest of their Olympic quad. 2024 World Championships is, I guess, happening in February. Uh, we already have British athletes expressing their unhappiness with that decision highlighted by James Guy reacting simply with I'm not going. <laughs> Will FINA try to either incentivize or force um, national governing bodies to send athletes if if they do keep this February world champs in place? I think they're going to have to. I don't know how else they really expect anybody to show up to this meet. It'll be Otherwise, maybe similar to a short course worlds, because, you know, we see we see a pretty decent European championship meet in Olympic years. So it's not like it's um, so out of left field to expect swimmers to show up in February, which is still, uh, you know, many a, a, a full chunk of training before the Olympics. Right. Like, let's not pretend like this is a late May world championship. It's a you know, it, there's plenty of time, especially for countries that don't have the same sort of. Um, rigorous qualifying as places like the U.S. and Australia do, where it's kind of a one-pop meet in the summer. I would love for them to get creative and come up with ways to present this meet that people want to go. I said in the comments, like, let's make it a grudge match meet. Let's let's have swimmers go head to head, throw down, you know, the Kyle Chalmers versus Caleb Dressel in the hundred free head to head. Winner gets. $20,000 loser goes home empty handed. Like that would make it fun to me. Like make Let's it make some kind of a, ISL. <laughs> well, yeah, but without the, without the other people in the lanes. And I, I have pitched this idea to ISL too, and they have no interest. In it. So it's but basically like a, pool and pool. <laughs> but like FINA style. But my question is, is so, but if FINA gets their, their hefty hosting fee or fee from the host, like, do they care if athletes show up? I mean, honestly. That's a great question. What is it to them? Yeah, because the quest, you know, these Middle Eastern countries have been hosting international competitions in, in, in both swimming and other sports. I think back to, to track and field a couple of years ago, and the stands are absolutely empty and they don't seem to care. They seem to be right. willing to continue to pay the fees to host them. Right. So that's a great question. Maybe, it, I mean, it, it may just not matter as long as they can put a reasonable product in the pool that. The powers that be in Qatar can look around and say, yes, we hosted a world championship meet. Maybe that's good enough. Preemptive sink or swim. Uh, <laughs> do you think this date will, will stay? I'm swimming it. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, they, they aren't surprised. I don't think there's, uh, I don't know. FINA at one point told me that they didn't think anybody had a negative reaction to Russia and swim meets. So who knows if, if they really know what's going on in the world around them. I would like to believe that FINA ex anticipated this reaction and made the decision anyway. Yeah. Cause yeah. remember, um, you know, they didn't decide to postpone the, the, you know, 2022 summer world championships, you know, they, that was the Fukuoka that decided to postpone it. So 
you know, that's something to consider as well. Well, and remember that FINA, FINA has its own, its own staff, but by and large, FINA is made up of representatives from the different governing bodies. So it's not like USA Swimming and British Swimming and Swimming Australia had no say in this, right? Like they, they all had a vote. They, the, the, the president's reputation is on the line and he's up for election in 2024, I think. Um, so like, it's not like the, the governing bodies didn't know about this until today. Do you, what do you think USA's team will look like? Or I guess, what do you think the selection process will be mm-hmm. for USA Swimming for this meet? Step one is going to be, do you want to attend the meet? I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't foresee USA Swimming compelling people to attend the meet if they don't want to. I don't think so either. I just don't think they have the leverage to do that. Um, so that'll be step one. After that, probably the same way they do short course worlds, right? It'll be some combination of who the fastest swimmers were the, the season before with who wants to go. And at some point they just start filling in slots with somebody that makes sense would be my guess. Yeah, I think so too. But they don't know. They told us, I asked them today and, and they said, TBD. <laughs> we are not that far in the schedule yet. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I see the tweets about, did they consult with the athletes? And, and Loretta, I know you kind of brought this up when we were chatting pre-show. I have, I have thoughts about that. <laughs> Number one, they probably did because they just elected that new athletes commission and, and that group didn't have a lot of time to meet, but I'm sure, I'm sure their opinions were known and I'm sure the athletes opinions were known through their national governing bodies. On the other hand, I do think the athletes sometimes have a little bit of a have your cake and eat it too mentality because in the athletes perfect world, they'd like to see this world championship meet not happen but they'd also like the prize money that comes along with having these big fees for these world championship meets. Um, so at some point you've got to show up and swim where the money is, if you want to make the money. Um, so I, that, that was my initial thought when I said that, and that's probably why athletes aren't always consulted because if you get a room full of athletes, I, I I've seen it in the ISL, right? Like I've seen, I've been in the room of full of athletes in the ISL and everybody wants everything, even when things are opposing forces, they want both of those things to happen. So consulting with athletes can sometimes be difficult, but that's, that's, that's why the athletes commission needs to exist, right? Because those athletes will have a better understanding of all of the forces in play and can advocate for what athletes want with a different perspective than maybe the average athlete who's who's just training and competing. That's world champs. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. We'll keep it on an international stage though. Uh, European junior championships, six day meet just concluded last or this past weekend, I guess uh, for you, Brayden and Loretta, what were your biggest standout swims or swimmers from the meet in Bucharest? Okay. So totally commenters are going to grill me for pronouncing the names wrong and I'm going to do my best. Okay. So the Polish so better than I would. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so NC state commit. We think he's still going there. Um, Kasseri Meshuk um, from Poland did repeat as the 100 and 200 backstroke champion from last year's European junior championships. And then this time around, he added the 50 back. So definitely dominated that entire discipline, got the championship record of 5291 in the hundred back, which that's a very good time for European juniors under 53 is very, very good. And then obviously David Popovich, he also repeated this. He did the 5100, 200 treble last year did the same thing this time around, which was ultra impressive because last year it was pre Tokyo Olympics. This year it was post, you know, Budapest worlds. And we obviously know he crushed it there and he was still able to, put up times that were just off. I mean, it was 47, 69, I think is what his final 100 time was. 200 was 145, 45. And he won that 200 free here by two seconds, over two seconds in Budapest. So, or in uh, wherever this was, oh gosh, somebody help me out. We're in the the Thank you. Yes. So anyway, so definitely held his taper, even if he didn't, he still would have totally crushed the field. So that was amazing to see as well. You know, for me, the, the best story is uh, Mary Mola from France. I, I think with Leon Marchand doing well at Worlds and, and Paris hosting the 2024 Olympics, um, I think it's always exciting to see French swimmers 
doing well or home home nation swimmers doing well at the Olympics. So Mary Mola winning the 50 back, albeit not an Olympic event in a new championship record and personal best time. I think that's exciting because French swimming has been sort of devoid of, of young talent, especially on the women's side recently. Um, and Ellie Jefimova from Estonia sweeping the breaststrokes um, was, was good. You know, she won the 200. That's probably not her event, but the 50 hundred was very good. 106 and the hundred is a, is a good time. Um, Lana Pudar, the, you know, it's a lot of swimmers from countries that are not traditional powers like Estonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lana Pudar won the 50, 200 fly, uh, Merv Tunsil from Turkey's, you know, burgeoning distance program under the guidance of Bob Bowman. Um, and she's going to USC next year or, you know, was at some point committed to go to USC next year. Um, we'll have to see if that still happens with the coaching change there, but, um, that's exciting both for USC and for Turkey. Um, Turkey's distance program continues to look very good. And then, you know, I think the kind of underrated swim was Nicoletta Padar from, uh, Hungary who went 54, six in the hundred free, which is great. Hungary is not traditionally known for their sprinters. Um, but they went one, two in the women's hundred free here. So maybe there's some, some future um, senior level contenders coming out of Hungary in the, the women's sprint events now. And they won yeah, that for Nicoletta, Nicoletta didn't even final in the hundred free last year. So even in, in one year span, then she all of a sudden got gold. So I think that speaks volumes. Yeah. For her tra uh, trajectory. So I think that's also exciting. You know what my favorite, my favorite moment of the European junior championships were? Okay, what? The, the Schmaluski brothers talking trash in the post-race comments after going 1-2 at the 200 fly. Did they really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, it, so Christoph won, his twin brother Mikhail was second, um, and, and his, his official post-race comments, so I, I guess the question was something like, why are you better than your brother? Yeah. And Christoph said, well, maybe he needs to work a little harder. Yes. And anybody who has a brother can appreciate that one. They're a twin. <laughs> I'm a twin. So I totally get that. And I said before that his brother, the, the silver medalist, is gaining on him. I think last year, um, Christoph was like, I don't know, maybe a second or something like that. And this time around, it was like, I think, 800 or something really small. So, you know. His brother's gun gunning for him, you know, so you can't be Who's too the better athlete between you and your twin sister, Loretta. Not me. I mean, obviously. He's <laughs> obviously. hands down. <laughs> Does your sister swim? Uh, no, she doesn't swim. Okay. She works like 90 hours a week. So yeah. Oh. Yeah. I know. <laughs> maybe she needs to work a little harder in the, in the pool. <laughs> you can well, we don't do two fly. I'm nails to Coleman at swim.com. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, our next meet we're discussing was stateside. <laughs> what Carson Foster, sorry, what Carson Foster referred to as the Austin Olympics, uh, the 2022 <laughs> sectionals. Uh, he was excited for this one, and obviously uh, for good reason. He had some sensational swims. What were you guys' biggest takeaways from these Austin sectionals last weekend? Well, we need to point out that um, the Texas swimmers have acknowledged that this was their summer taper meet. Carson, for sure, is not going to nationals. Um, he's going to back off a little bit for the rest of the summer, <laughs> recover, and then uh, hit the college season again. Um, you know, I, I think there's a few obvious takeaways. Carson has a ton of potential in a lot of races, going 153 in the 200 fly in an event that he hasn't really trained for. Um, which I loved, you know, his, his coach, when we asked about the breathing, every stroke basically said, well, it wasn't really a plan. We just don't really train for this event. So he just kind of did whatever he did. And maybe now we'll figure out what we're going to do on that. Um, so I love, I love that. Um, Shane Casas continues to be Shane Casas and show he's, he's got all the potential in the world. He's just got to show up and do it. Um, which you know, was a story about Carson for a while and he did figure it out. So maybe Shane can go down that path too. And then uh, Kelly Pash on the women's side, uh, you know, is going to get overshadowed by, by the guys who were on the world championship team, but she had a really great meet after skipping the international trials after an NC, a great NCAA meet. Um, you know, the women's butterflies are still very, very difficult races to break through on. Um, but I think we could see her on a Paris Olympic team. So Keep an eye out there. 
I mean, for me, I just, I can't, going back to Foster, I just can't believe you just said it was basically like kind of an off event because like, bam, all of a sudden he's the number three U.S. performer, like all time. I mean, that's just nuts to me. Like 153.6, I think is what it was. And now they're going to just discuss like tactics or breathing. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's just crazy to me. Talent, right? Like we talk about this in other sports all the time. We talk about this in basketball. Sometimes talent just wins. Yes. Oh my gosh. So that, that was my takeaway, Pullman. <laughs> well, and I, I love to see that he has said like, yeah, I've been training for the 500 or I've been doing a lot more aerobic or distance work kind of since those Olympic trials when he got ran down by Jay in the 400 IM and like it showed here, right? Not only did he have a sensational uh, two IM, four IM in Budapest, but 345 in the 400 free you know, number 10 U.S. performer all time, gets a PB in the two back at 155. It's like, yeah, he's start, He's really starting to look dangerous. Um, I mean, I think his biggest question will be, how is how does he pare down his event lineup, you know? Right. Is he going right. to swim only three events at Olympic trials, or is he going to do four or five? I wish he would have swum one of his, like, IM events, one of his world events, just so we could get kind of a, like, a benchmark for – you know, is, is, was he really at full power here or was he two seconds off full power just so we could get an idea of like where he could be in that 400 free or where he could be in that 200 fly if he had done it at worlds instead of at the post worlds wind down meet. Agreed. And he had like the two IM was that last day would have been a perfect just a little, just a throw it in there for for comparison, but yeah. excuse me for us to wait. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I was hoping Shane was going to swim the two IM, and he didn't, did he? I don't think he did. No, no. I think Sam Stewart ended up winning it in some time. I don't remember what. But... <laughs> I I still think that Shane could be like he could be the guy in the two hundred IM. How's his breaststroke? What's I mean, his breaststroke just... like though? It's good in a two IM. I mean, okay. I think he's so one fifty six. Like, he can fake it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's been one fifty six two IM. So it's like okay, you know, it's solid, that, super solid. That can make the team. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, he was as fast as Hugo Gonzalez um, when he won the NCAA title in twenty twenty one. He had basically the same split as Hugo and Hugo's a great breaststroker. Okay. He had a faster split than Carson, who's an okay breaststroker. Um, there weren't a lot of good uh, Kyle Pumpitis. There weren't a lot of good breaststrokers in that field to compare it to, but he had the second fastest split just behind Hugo. So keeping it within the family of college swimming, we had big conference change news this week. UCLA and USC are heading to the big 10 while it is reported that there are talks of Clemson, UNC, Florida state and Virginia trying to move to the SEC. So just continuing in the trend of mind-boggling conference moves. Um, we, it, there was one interesting article about UCLA that the financial implications of this could save their Olympic sports uh, by then switching to the Big Ten. Um, just, Braden, we'll start with you. What are your initial thoughts on, on all of these huge Power Five schools just jumping ship on their traditional conferences. I, you know, people keep asking me what this means for swimming and other Olympic sports. And I think the answer at the end of the day is that we don't really know yet because not only are the realignments not done, um, even if they're done for this summer, they're not done, done. Um, (laughs) You know, we have another, we probably, we might have another decade of this chaos. Um, and hopefully college sports survives that chaos because a lot of people are tired of it. It's just, it's just can be exhausting, but um, I digress. Uh, there, there's going to be other changes as well, right? Like what's going to happen with the new money. There's only so many buildings you can build. There's only so many weight rooms you can build for the football team. There's only so many dining halls you can build at some point. The expectation is that all of this extra money is going to go to paying the athletes. Um, and by the athletes, I mean the football and basketball players primarily, and then a select few other athletes in other sports at certain schools might get a little bit. Um, so 
that's the big question is is will this will the end game be college football essentially is professional sports and that just changes everything right if if college football remains nominally amateur even though we know it hasn't really been amateur for a long time then some of this money could trickle down to the olympic sports um if college football does not remain nominally amateur it's a crapshoot who knows what that money is going to go to i i like to believe that at some point the athletics directors have to throw a bone to the olympic sports to continue to sort of justify what what college athletics is um because at some point the presidents might the presidents of these universities who ultimately have the final say in all of these things might say that they have deviated too far from the missions of the university and that they need to stand on their own two feet which i don't think is a model that works so that's to me that's where the olympic sports hope is, is of coming out of this in a better situation some president at the university looking around and saying you know what it's good for us to have olympians here it's good for us to win conference titles even if it's in swimming and nobody really cares um, all of these things are good for us even if the money doesn't make sense on a direct basis i just i feel like like you said 10 years from now i think we're gonna have like two conferences <laughs> like i feel like everything's consolidating to the fact that literally in some are moving and whatnot, but I, I really genuinely feel like the number of conferences are going to shrink. And just from a fan's perspective, I'm a huge, huge football fan. Like, you know, the fewer conferences, the fewer conference rivalries you have, you know, like big 10, at least football wise, like we're totally anti sec. So for one example, if they were to ever merge or like teams would cross those boundaries in that respect, from a fan, you know, point of view, you kind of lose, you know, some of the sacredness that is, you know, Big Ten versus SEC versus, you know, ACC that way. That way, well, I think. To me, to me, the piece of this that's kind of weird is in college football, every conference negotiates its television deals separately, right? In professional football, the AFC does not negotiate a separate deal from the NFC. It's all negotiated at the same time by the same people. Um, so I still see the end game of this being another split of division one football in the Boston colleges and Wake Forest and Fresno States of the world become a like sort of a mid tier of division one, a football and the top 50 teams split off, become their own thing, and then just negotiate television deals on their own. Right. Cause the, the reason the conferences negotiate their own television deals now is because there's so much more value in some of the conferences than in others of the conferences. Right. But if you if you limit things to the top X teams, whatever that number is, um, and I'm sure somebody's gone through and calculated what that number is, but at some point you wind up at a space where they're better off together than apart because everybody is more similar in value, right? Like the 40th most valuable program is more similar to the first most valuable program than the 90th is. So at that point, the negotiating leverage might be there where they just negotiate with ESPN and Fox and whoever else wants in on it as a block, um, you know, the, whether that's the NCAA's responsibility or however they format that. I still see this ending with another split in college athletics where the top X teams go off and, and do their own thing because hmm. they just have too much leverage, right? Like right now, and it's not even that they'll leave. Right now that I think about it, it's at some point, the other schools will get sick of competing in a league where they have no power. You know, if, if you're one of the left behind schools, why would you want to continue to just bend to the will of the SEC and the Big Ten unless that's where they're, the money was? If that continues to be financially more beneficial than just going and playing their own national championship. Um, so we'll see how that all shakes out, but I still think there's going to be another split where, um, the whole conference thing will be reevaluated altogether. I hate it. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, like, I don't, I, I'm losing interest in college football. It's just, I don't like it. It's just not fun to me. Like it, the college sports live under this, this guise that it's, 
oh, they're just like the rest of us, right? Like they, they're in class with the rest of us. They chose this university because they believe in the spirit of this university. And I, I, you could only erode that so much by, by these changes um, before people just stop caring. It becomes minor league baseball, which is, you know, mm-hmm. fun and great, but it's not like a thing that Maybe. we're passionate about. <laughs> so in the short term for swimming, like in the next two to three years, uh, I, I mean, I'm trying to think about like a college swimming season who you have dual meets against what a conference meet looks like. It doesn't seem like it's really going to change that much in terms of how teams move around, because we see a lot of the top programs having, a, you know, dual meets with each other, even if they're not in the same conference now. Right. And so it's like you maybe if you're USC or UCLA, you have a couple more travel dual meets throughout the season and then your conference meet it has different teams, but it's, it doesn't seem like it's really going to change that much for swimmers in the short term. And I've had to kind of explain that to um, a lot of mainstream talk radio shows over the last week. The big 10 does have some conference scheduling. The SEC does have some conference scheduling, um, but like they, they aren't going to do, they aren't going to make USC and UCLA fly across the country to Penn state every year they're going to take like one trip and they'll do a couple of quads and that'll be the end of it they'll continue to just make their own schedule they'll probably continue to swim against pac-12 schools if we're honest um unless you know when for example when a&m and left the big 12 one side or the other depending on who you ask said no you can't compete against each other anymore because we're pissed at each other (laughs) so maybe that'll happen with the pac-12 schools and they'll be forced to swim big 10 schools um but ultimately it's just chaos. Nobody cares about swimming. Nobody's it's not, it's not why they're making the decisions. So they'll work out the swimming. However, they need to work out the swimming. So moving on after the conclusion of the world championships in Budapest, uh, Mary Sophie Harvey came forward um, saying that she thought she was drugged in an after party in a Budapest club. So Braden, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, do you think FINA or national governing bodies should reconsider their involvement in athletes extracurriculars after a big meets like this conclusion um, after, after this whole incident? Well, it's interesting because at the Olympic games, most of the partying happens in the athletes village, right? It's a much more sort of controlled, um, atmosphere. It's either in the athletes village or in the, um, national Olympic committee, like the, the USA house or whatever. That's where a lot of the partying happens. Um, at these sport specific meets, they tend to be more athlete driven. Um, and this happens at every meet. There's always an after party. I, you know, during the pandemic, this was the explanation for a lot of COVID cases after these meets. Oh yeah. That, that whole team, was there. The Scandinavians are infamous for um, being sort of instigators in some of these parties. Um, You know, it's a liability for FINA if they become involved. So I don't know if they want to. Um, The athletes are adults, right? Like they have to handle themselves um, to some extent. And, And FINA, I don't know that FINA can roll in and say, you can't go out to a bar after you're done swimming. Like, I don't know that FINA actually has that authority. Um, And national governing bodies can put in place policies. And depending on the strength of the team culture there, those policies might hold, they might not hold. Um, Remember the nightclub collapse in South Korea. This isn't the first time that something bad has happened at one of these parties, right? There are a lot of aquatic athletes when that, the, the, balcony collapsed at that night nightclub an American uh, water polo player had to have surgery after a, a big wooden shard went through her leg. Um, so these kind of things happen. Um, and it, you know, swimmers being there, or not being there, these things are, go- these, these are things that happen in, in bars, right? Like they shouldn't happen in bars, but they do happen in bars. I don't know that FINA has responsibility per se, unless it's organized by a FINA person, um, in which case they do. Um, You know, and and at the same time, there's just not a lot of details about what happened here, right? Like there was no toxicology report. uh, Nobody saw anything. Um, 
there, there were other athletes who said that the same thing may have happened to them, but we don't know who those athletes are. So without more information, I don't even know what FINA could do. Um, it, you know, if, it, if they find out it was another athlete that slipped something into her drink, that would be a different story. But right now it's, it's hard to see what FINA or governing bodies could really do about it other than you know, in countries like the U.S., Canada, and Australia, maybe they just have an athlete's conduct contract that says no alcohol on on team trips or whatever that is. But that's going to cause them a whole other set of headaches. Um, you know, again, listen to the athletes. Did you ask the athletes about this, et cetera, et cetera? So, I'm just anti bureaucracy, kind of interfering in people's personal lives, whether it's Fina or anybody else. So for me, that's my perspective. Is they're out of the pool. They're in no, like you said, they could have been any person on the street that just goes into a bar. They happen to be a swimmer in the same city. So that's, that's my stance. The less bureaucratic interference, the better in this case, Fina. I mean, and, and like Braden said, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to want to get involved in the first place. But um, yeah, I mean, we just, after uh, being at Mary Sophie's press conference and kind of, you know, people asking, well, is Swimming Canada conducting an investigation? Has FINA said anything on the matter? It's interesting because obviously you want to get to the bottom of it. And it's like, if, the, if that is what happened, she did get drugged by someone that's awful and um, you want repercussions. But at the same time, it's like, well, they weren't you know, it wasn't at the meet. It wasn't at the pool. Um, it's kind of a hard what, situation. What's Shana going to do that Hungarian police aren't going to do? Like mm-hmm. to me, it's a yeah. it's a police investigation. Um, and and Fina and Swimming Canada both got some heat. Fina especially for not being aware that it happened. So you know, maybe there's some duty to say, hey, these are the good parts of town. These are the bad parts of town. These are the the this strip of bars is usually okay. You know, I don't know. Again, there's a lot of liability if they start doing those sorts of things, but sure. Um, well, there was like it, it's, it's, after, 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 the, after the you should have known, but like again, I just all they can do is arm athletes with information. I think the athletes have to make their decisions about where they go and what they do. Well, I, I was thinking too, I think it was the 2019 World Championships. I think it was Hungarian Tomas Kenderesi was like detained basically because he sexually assaulted a waitress at a bar. And Fina, no one looked to Fina to say, hey, you got to, you know, give him some kind of punishment. They let the the Korean government deal with him and then ultimately the Hungarian government deal with him. So it's different circumstances, but same kind of, you know, situation that like some kind of rule or, or law was most likely violated. And no one looked to Fina like as the the punisher. You know what I mean? They looked to the actual governments that had the authority to do so. Right. I, I You know, I can tell you exactly how this is going to play out. Fina is not going to say anything else about it. Um, Mary Sophie Harvey is going to become involved in, in causes which are noble and important um, to, to fight this kind of behavior. And that'll that'll kind of be the outcome is, is what I would expect. I don't think at this point there's going to be any police intervention. I don't think Fina's I don't think there's anything for Fina to do. They put out a statement because people ask them about it. Um, they're going to keep taking meets back to Budapest because Budapest is generally viewed as, as being as safe as any other large city in the world. So it's, it's just going to trickle out and, and Mary Sophie Harvey will, will bring visibility to it. And that's probably a good thing, right? Like it's, it's important to bring more visibility to these issues because the more people who are aware of them, the less likely they are to happen. If there's more eyeballs on everybody's drinks in a bar. There's, it's more likely somebody's going to see something um, I, from the governing bodies, I think they're just going to kind of let this drift off into the, the memory. Well, so. and to your point of uh, arming the athletes with information, I think there was a level of comfort going into this soiree or gathering because at this bar, I think we, we never got to the bottom of it, I don't think, but uh, at least one or two swimmers were said to have been informally hosting or telling other swimmers about this. Um, there, it was common knowledge that there were swimmers and non-swimmers at this gathering, but like, you know, it, it was kind of like, oh, hey, we're in Budapest. Let's go here. Right. And then until somebody comes up with a contract that somebody was paid to be the host of this, it's all hearsay, right? Because we know that that club and bar party promoters can be sketchy. 
Um, we know that everybody's going to run from this as fast as they can. Anybody who could be liable from this is going to run as fast as they can. And every swimmer I've talked to who was there basically was like, yeah, I was invited by some Hungarian swimmer. I don't really know who it was. Um, but like, it's not, it, that doesn't necessarily mean the Hungarian swimmers were hosting, right? They're just the locals. They've got the local vibe. They know what's going on. So I, I assume some swimmer was getting a little kickback for, for making this happen, but like, we're never going to really know how that played out um, until Hungarian police become involved. And we have no indication that they are. All right. Well, that does it for our news this week. And on that note, it's time to play our favorite game, Sink or Swim. Michigan State Swimming and Diving uh, got a new budget proposal. They sent it off to the leaders. Sink or Swim, Michigan State will be reinstated as a swimming and diving team. Hmm. I am... Sinking it not because I don't think their proposal is sound or reasonable. I am sinking it because it just feels like in college athletics, momentum is everything and they've cut the program and I don't see them going back on that. I think it's interesting that they're presenting all of these huge donations that they've gotten as funding the program for X years rather than setting it up as an endowment. Um, again, as we talked about, we don't know what all that new Big Ten money is going to go towards. So that I don't think you can rely on that. To me, the most interesting thing is that Michigan State is getting a 50-meter pool regardless, an indoor brand-new 50-meter pool. Um, so to me, that's going to make it a lot harder for the athletics director to justify why he cut it. But at the end of the day, I just don't think anybody's going to care enough to change anything. So I'm going to sink it uh, because I'm a pessimist. I'm thinking it just because being come from, from Kentucky, I remember in Western Kentucky University, different scenario, but their program was given a five-year probation and it never came back. So I was burned by that. So I'm, now I'm going to be burned by Michigan State. So I'm thinking it. Stony Brook did bring their program back. So there is a counter example, but All right. well, I'm still thinking it. <laughs> I'm still amazed that Bruce Marchionda, who's Claire Curzan's coach, was the coach at Western Kentucky before. It's had a wild trajectory. Uh, I'm sinking it as well just because I don't – yeah, once the school cut it, they were at the bottom of the conference pretty regularly. It's like they don't have a, a rich – history program filled with swimming and diving accolades like they've had good swimmers and obviously from the swimming perspective we want more swimming programs but from if i was their athletics director and thinking of the whole thing i wouldn't necessarily be super motivated to try to get it back uh that again is coleman at swimswim.com who thinks that does <laughs> not have a rich swimming history in spite of being the NCAA runners up in 1951 and twice hosting the NCAA championships. Um, uh, very little. <laughs> yeah. 70 years ago, NCAA champions. I just don't see that as good motivation. NCAA runners up. Like runners you up. sunk it too. You sunk. <laughs> but you know, I didn't say Fair to know his email address. History. <laughs> that was you Coleman. That's fine. Um, they, I, I would not say they've done, they've been at the bottom of the conference for the last 20 years. There's one alumni who sends me explicative filled, uh, messages every time we write anything about Michigan state, be it positive, negative, or otherwise, because he <laughs> thinks that we're the reason that they got cut. Oh, geez. So Yeesh. he will now be coming. Your way. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. That's, that's my take. Uh, next up, will the fastest theoretical mixed 400 free relay time, which is by Australia, 316.63, be attained within the next decade? That's 10 years, if you don't know. The current <laughs> world record is from 2022 World Championships just last month, 319.38. So that's over two and a half seconds in the next decade. Sink or swim. I'm going to swim it just, just because I think within a decade, especially with all the hype and the lead up to LA 2028, I think that, you know, men's times consistently being 47 low women's times consistently being 52 low 51 high will become more common. So it won't take as much of a 
sort of flukish everybody being on on the same day to get there. So I'm going to swim it. I'm actually sinking it because those 47s you're talking about, like it's hard to put four of those together on the same relay. Like there's a sprinkle well, you here. You only need two of there. them because the women don't have to go 47s. Okay. You know what I'm saying? It, it, to have the people on the same team at the same time, it's magical. And I just don't know if that's going to happen. So I'm sinking it. It's going to happen because America just has too many swimmers for it to not happen. It's, um, just, sure. it's just the reality. Like we just have too many swimmers, in my opinion, for it to not happen. The, I'm going to give these splits for some context. So it was Cam McAvoy, 4791, Kyle Chalmers, 4644, Kate Campbell, 50.93, Emma you. McCann, 51.35. So it's actually the women who are Kate. way more impressive on that relay than the men. Uh, I get Kyle's split is also historically incredible, but Again, that's the theoretical fastest mixed foreigner free relay within a certain era. I'm thinking it as well. I just, I don't think the stars will align that much. Plus, I don't think it's swum enough. It's only swum basically at world championships every two years, that's which is true. why we've seen the world record get broken almost every time it has been swum at a world championship. And since Australia's never again sending a full team to the world championships. <laughs> <laughs> Probably never gonna happen. So yeah, I, I think that's that's too good for the next ten years. Um, and we're ending it. what? I still swim it. And we're ending with a fun one. This isn't this is a swim or swim. Uh, it was National Pool Day a few days ago. We put out an article where a lot of our writers got to share their favorite pool and why. You two both did, but in case our especially our podcast listeners missed it, uh, I wanted to just have a round table for a sec. Go around. What's your favorite pool and why? Braden, you can start. So my favorite is the Lagardo Slog, speaking of butchering, um, pool in, in Reykjavik, Iceland. It's actually in the suburbs of Reykjavik. Um, it was just such a cool vibe. There was so much going on. They have this weird bridge that like goes across the pool just to keep you from having to walk around. Um, and so between that and the hot tubs, like as a swammer, it satisfies all of my lazy dreams and i just can't get out of my head how much i love being able to take a bridge across the pool and sitting in a hot tub uh, to your specific temperature preferences after your workout it's just it's just a fun vibe big water slide it's got one of everything all right mine's not nearly as exotic <laughs> mine was north through high school savannah nor uh savannah ohio where i grew up yes Brain's gonna roll his eyes, but it was short course like meters, which was, huh? <laughs> but anyway, the you go and the the story behind it is that I came full circle. I swam there in high school, and I've also swum there masters. So it was circle of life in that pool, and you go into the locker rooms that look exactly the same as when I was there in high school, which was then about thirty years old. So it's green, rusty lockers, but I still love them. I, there, you know, there's nothing like a pool that can give you tetanus. That is just, <laughs> I, I'm, all of my favorite pools have the potential to kill me. So I, 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 I memories I made memories. <laughs> my favorite pool is the pool that I'm going to in just a couple weeks, Irvine, California. I can't believe it's a high school, but it's got two dueling 50 meter pools. It's outdoors. It's always great weather. They have the best hospitality at every single one of those meets. <laughs> and they have an awesome waffle sandwich place right down the road. Always Irvine great weather. is amazing. Irvine always has the best weather. I seem to recall there being a Nationals. It was the one that Kobe was at where it was so hot that we couldn't work because our computers kept shutting down. Oh, God. <laughs> Dude, but like to me, it's like maybe a, maybe 90, maybe 95. Like that's still like great summer weather. I guess if you just have to stand in the air conditioned mix zone and do interviews. <laughs> Makes sense. That's do, do do. real work. <laughs> All right. That's the swim swim breakdown. Tune in every week for your week's news and swimming.